Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel. Well, one of the first videos I ever made for this channel was on the four virtues. And I chose this starting point because this, to me, is the foundation of the whole of Plato's philosophy. Back at that time, though, I was still learning a lot about how to make videos. I mean, just like the physical process of making the video. And I'm still far from professional, but my editing skills have gotten a bit better. Certainly the sound quality is better now. So I've had the idea for a while to revisit this topic, in part because I think the virtues deserve a better quality video, but also because this is a topic that is worth coming back to time and again. It really is an important one. So similar to what I did in that earlier video, I will summarize the four virtues as they're outlined in Plato's Republic. To understand how Plato organized this, it helps to be familiar with his presentation of what is known in academia as the tripartite soul. Now, this triangle is probably not your image of a soul, but let's just run with it. So he argues that there are three affections in the soul. Two of them, he says, are easy to recognize. There is a part of us that desires, and this part can be quite powerful, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but there is also a rational part. And here's a quote from the Republic. Socrates says, are we to say then that some men, sometimes though thirsty, refuse to drink? And his interlocutor Glaucon replies, We are indeed, many and often. What then should one affirm about them? Is it not that there is a something in the soul that bids them drink, and a something that forbids, a different something that masters that which bids? I think so. Well, then Socrates names these two parts in this way. Shall we claim that they are two and different from one another, naming that in the soul whereby it reckons and reasons the rational, and that with which it loves, hungers, thirsts, and feels the flutter and titillation of other desires, the irrational and appetitive, companion of various repletions and pleasures? So these two affections, the rational and the irrational, prove easy enough to delineate. But then Socrates introduces a third. These two forms, then, let us assume to have been marked off as actually existing in the soul. But now the thumos, or principle of high spirit, that with which we feel anger, is it a third, or would it be identical in nature with one of these? One of these, of course, referring to the other two. Well, he and his interlocutor Glaucon consider its similarities to the other two affections. And they ultimately decide, though, that it is indeed a separate and third affection in the soul. This third affection is something which we might loosely call willpower, or the high-spirited part of the soul. When it is weak, it sides with the desires, and it whispers to us to indulge in some pleasure that will give us momentary satisfaction. But in the more virtuous person, this affection acts in the service of the rational part of the soul. Socrates concludes that in the soul there exists a third kind, this principle of high spirit, which is the helper of reason by nature, unless it is corrupted by evil nurture. Okay, so these are the three affections in the soul. The Greek names for these are the logos, the thumos, and the epithumia. Keeping in mind these three affections in the soul, we can outline the four virtues and how they function. 
Well, any discussion of Plato's virtues must begin with wisdom. This is a state of mind that develops through the rational affection in the soul. Socrates defines wisdom as a kind of good counsel in the soul. And surely this very thing, good counsel, is a form of wisdom. For it is not by ignorance, but by knowledge, that men counsel well. There is an analogy of the soul to a city-state that runs throughout most of the Republic. And I do discuss this in some other videos, so I won't go into it here. But I do want to mention it because you can see traces of this in some of the quotes that I'm going to use. And in this language of this analogy, Socrates discusses wisdom in this way. Then is there any science in the city just founded by us residing in any of its citizens which does not take counsel about some particular thing in the city, but about the city as a whole and the betterment of its relations with itself and other states? Why, yes, there is. And what is it? and in whom is it found? And Glaucon replies that it is the science of guardianship or government, and is to be found in those rulers to whom we just now gave the name of guardians in the full sense of the word. And so just as wisdom is in the rulers of our ideal city-state, so too wisdom is what ideally rules or guides the soul. And then Socrates goes on to ask, In what term, then, do you apply to the city because of this knowledge? And Glaucon replies, well advised and truly wise. And analogously, so too is a soul wise, if it is guided by wisdom. And notice that in the diagram, the rational part of the soul is depicted as the smallest. And we see this as well described in the Republic. And would not these rulers be the smallest of all the groups of those who possess special knowledge and receive distinctive appellations? By far. Then it is by virtue of its smallest class and minutest part of itself, and the wisdom that resides therein, in the part which takes the lead in rules, that a city established on principles of nature would be wise as a whole. And again, when reading the Republic, it is always important to remember that the city-state is functioning as an analogy to the soul. The virtues, as Socrates is talking about them, are actually in the soul. And the virtuous state, you can see, is the natural state. The condition of soul that we are aiming for is a healthy state of mind. And we can all achieve it with the right training because it's natural. Now, to make it even clearer that Plato is actually focused on the soul rather than the city-state, here is a quote from Socrates later in the dialogue. He says, Since the philosophers are those who are capable of apprehending that which is eternal and unchanging, while those who are incapable of this but lose themselves and wander amid the multiplicities of multifarious things, these people are not philosophers. So which of the two kinds ought to be the leaders in a state? Well, on the surface, this statement doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This description far better fits that of mystics than of world leaders. This dialogue really doesn't make sense when it's read as though it were actually a political treatise. However, when it is recognized as a spiritual text, then great insights can emerge. Okay, so the soul then ought to be guided by that part of it which can touch and know that which is eternal and unchanging. And this is what it means to live wisely. The next virtue to look at is courage, and this is associated with that high-spirited part of the soul. The role of courage, then, is to come to the aid of the wisdom-loving part of the soul. 
Its role is to ensure that the soul remains focused on what is right and true. Preserving this focus both in pain and pleasures and in desires and fears and does not expel it from his soul. Socrates goes on to say that this power in the soul then, this unfailing conservation of right and lawful belief about things to be and not to be feared, is what I call and would assume to be courage. As we get deeper into philosophy, there are fears that might deter us. For example, we might fear that we're going too far down this philosophy rabbit hole and it might affect our careers. Or we might alienate friends or family members and rejection hurts, so we fear it. These losses, though, are not losses from the perspective of the soul. And so they're not things that ought to deter us from the quest to know the self. Likewise, many spiritual aspirants have been sidetracked by pleasures such as sex or food or alcohol. However, the courageous state of mind stays focused on reality itself and does not allow us to get sidetracked. There is a certain trust that we develop over time that focusing on eternal truth will always turn out for the best. Next, I will turn to temperance. The Greek word is sophrosun. It is translated in many different ways. So temperance is perhaps the most common translation, but some others are soberness, moderation, and sound-mindedness. And whichever translation you prefer, sophrosun is perhaps the most misunderstood of the four virtues. A common image that we have of Safrasun is that of self-control in the sense of denying ourselves pleasures that our common sense tells us are bad for us. A more accurate image, though, is one of not desiring what is unhealthy for the soul. I imagine that some of you watching this engage in some sort of theurgic practice such as meditation. But even if you don't, though, imagine starting such a practice. Early on, you would probably dabble a bit here and there, a few short meditations a week, perhaps. And this would fit into a lifestyle that is otherwise what most people would call normal. Your school or work, you've got family, friends. I imagine you probably indulge in unhealthy foods now and then, or perhaps drink heavily on the weekends. This is all part of social life. However, the more you meditate, the more aware you become of changes in your body. Meditation or yoga or any kind of energy-focused practice will make you more conscientious of your body's needs and the effect that certain foods, for example, have on the body. So we start to naturally desire fruits and vegetables, whereas we may not have ever done that before. And heavy foods such as cake or fried chicken are more likely to leave us feeling bad. Now, if over time you were to deepen that meditation practice, you would probably reach a point where you rarely ever indulge in unhealthy foods maybe an occasional taste here and there of some favorite food, but a feast of junk food would just leave you feeling sick. Even the thought of gorging on cookies or deep fry would be enough to make you queasy. And this is because you are becoming more aware of what is healthy for your body and what is unhealthy. Now, this same principle also functions at the level of the soul. And of course, developing the soul is, after all, the goal of meditation. As our studies deepen and we gain some practical experience through methods such as meditation, for example, then we are going to grow in temperance. We're going to start to ask ourselves or be aware of which situations are healthy for us which are not. We're going to find that drama is no longer exciting. It's draining instead of being exciting. 
and we'll find ourselves just outgrowing people and situations that no longer serve us. Desires for social measures of success, such as wealth and status, will become overshadowed by the hunger to know the true self. In other words, we will find ourselves naturally desiring what is healthy for us and pulling away from what is unhealthy. And this is what temperance is really about. It's not about resisting temptation. It is more accurately a state of mind in which our desires naturally fall in line with the wisdom of the rational part of the soul. Socrates describes the state of mind of one in which the rulers and the ruled are of one mind as to who ought to rule. Now this, of course, is in the language of the analogy to the city-state, but we can see this in the soul as well. And so there is a harmony throughout the soul, the three parts of the soul all functioning together in a balanced and ordered way. Temperance extends literally through the entire gamut throughout, bringing about the unison in the same chant of the strongest, the weakest, and the intermediate. Now applying this to the soul, it describes harmony and unison in the soul as a whole. The desires falling in line with the wisdom-loving part and so the person is not pulled in one direction by one affection and in another direction by another. And this brings us to justice, the last of the virtues presented in the Republic. In the soul that is wise, courageous, and temperate, each of the affections in the soul is carrying out its own proper function. Early in our studies, the conceptual awareness of this goal is the foundation that allows the other virtues to develop in the first place. And once they do take hold to some degree, justice is what holds them in place. Socrates describes justice as a quality which made it possible for them all to grow up in the body politic, and which, when they have sprung up, preserves them as long as it is present. A just soul is guided by the wisdom-loving part. A soul that is guided by the desires would chase every whim and be spurred on by the highs and the lows of experience. And such a person then has no real direction. A soul that is guided by the high-spirited part, on the other hand, is likely to be a greedy person or someone who is ambitious in a callous way or someone who's perhaps too prideful or arrogant. The proper function of the high-spirited part is to protect the wisdom that guides the soul. When these roles are switched, the rational element in the soul gets reduced to rationalizing. This person will, instead of being wise, will just rely on being clever this person will come up with clever defenses for the ambitions that rule that soul. Okay, so these are a few examples of souls that lack balance and order, and in which the three parts of the soul are not carrying out their proper function. And then you also hopefully see the state of mind that accompanies each one of these examples. And so I hope that with these examples, you see more clearly that each affection in the soul has its own proper role and its own proper function. And the state of mind of a person who has this proper functioning, we call this a healthy soul, we can also call this justice. So I hope this look at the four virtues helps clarify what they are and how they function. Let me know in the comments what you thought of all of this. Platonism is a wisdom tradition. It shows us how to develop a healthy soul while still functioning in the world. We don't run off to a monastery to do our training. Instead, we work with our human side in our quest to know our divine side. 
And this is a distinction that makes Platonism rare, perhaps not unique, but certainly rare. And the virtues are a very important element in that development. So for more on the virtues, I've linked a couple more videos here at the end. Okay, that's all for today. Thanks for watching. Till next time.